Good morning. Welcome to Christ the King. I sound really loud today. Am I really loud? <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here too. Welcome to our, our guests who joined us for our service today. Why don't you take a moment to say hi to the other people worshiping Jesus together with you this morning. In your worship folder today, you'll notice that you got a, a connection card. We've been using these each week. If you're a visitor today, we'd love to have you put down your, your name and some information so we can contact you and invite you back to our church. For everybody, members and visitors, on the back side, you can put some prayer requests. You can make comments about our, our service or our sermon today. And In our prayer of the church this morning, we're going to pray for a number of people whom you wrote down on your connection cards last week as people needing prayers. So I appreciate that way to, to stay connected with you. There's a whole bunch of things in our world for us to focus our attention on. But God's word today stops us and it reminds us of something. The Bible today reminds us that everything in this world is just a shadow. Because the real thing is Jesus. Our lessons from the Bible today and especially our sermon, we're going to be reminded not to put our trust in men, in human beings but to put our trust in God, everything else is a shadow. The reality is found in Christ. If you open up your worship folder to page 4, you'll see our verse of the day is from Colossians chapter 2, verse 17. Let's read that verse together. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Begin by singing our, our opening song. We've been using it throughout the season of Epiphany. It's the song, Christ Begins. My prophet, my priest, my king, 
a light in the dark. Christ steps in, here's my Savior, my God, my King. The time has come, Christ begins. Please stand. Continue with our confession of sins on page six. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Bible warns, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Too often we followed our own sinful ways instead of the way of the Lord. Even worse, when we've sinned, we, we blame God for what we ourselves have done. A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Instead, let's confess our sins together to our God. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We'll pause for a moment of silence to each privately confess our sins to God. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God's greatest wisdom is found at the cross of Jesus who died to pay for the sins of the world. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his own Son, Jesus, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. You know, in our sermons this month, we've been going through the book of Colossians, and one word that we've heard over and over is about God's grace, about God's love for us, even when we don't deserve it. So after confessing our sins, we're going to learn one more new song for today. It's on page 7 in your worship folder. It's the song, His Mercy is More. And it's all about how God's grace, how God's mercy is more than even all of our sins. So we'll sing his mercy is more together.
Isn't that a beautiful song? Our sins, they are many, as mercy is more. I forgot to tell you about the fine print on the bottom. It says that you sing the, stand, the refrain three times. But we did it anyways. So that, that was good. We'll keep practicing that song. It's time now to turn to our lessons from God's Word. And our Old Testament lesson today is from Jeremiah chapter 17. Here the prophet Jeremiah with some powerful pictures tells us that it's foolish to trust in human beings, but those who trust in God are blessed. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its root by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is God's word. It's a powerful comparison, isn't it? To trust in human beings is like to live in the desert. To trust in God is like being a big tree planted by streams of water. It's the same picture that we see in our psalm for today. It's the very first psalm, Psalm 1. We'll read it responsively. Please join in in reading the, the verses that are in the bold print. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Please stand for the reading of our gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson today are some words from Jesus from the gospel of Luke chapter 6. Here Jesus tells us that if we're going to follow him, we have to have an upside down perspective on things in our world. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is God's word. You may be seated. For our next song, I invite our our Sunday school children to come up here to the front. They're going to lead us in singing the song, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Note that the children will sing verse 1 and then all three refrains. And we, as a congregation, are invited to join in singing verses 2 and 3.
Any other children who are here today are invited to come up for our, our children's devotion. Thanks for singing today. That was great. It's good to have you all here. Today I have to stand kind of over here because I want to show you something. All right? I can do something really cool on the floor. All right? Watch the floor. Are you ready? Wow, isn't that cool? I can make a hand on the floor. Have you ever seen something like that before? Yeah, of course you have, right? You're not very impressed. It's a shadow, right? It's a shadow and I can move my hand around and I can do all these things and shadows are pretty cool, right? But what would you say? What, what's cooler, a shadow or the thing that actually makes the shadow? Yeah, I know. I, some people can make animals and shapes with their hands. I'm not able to do that. But thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, some people can actually do even cooler things than I can with, with, with my hand as a shadow. But, but here's the point I want you to think about. Would you rather have a shadow of a hand or have a real hand? A real hand, right? Shadows are cool, but they're nothing compared to the real thing. Would you rather have a shadow of an ice cream cone or a real ice cream cone? A real ice cream cone. A real ice cream cone. <laughs> Right? How about the shadow of a bike or a real bike? A real bike. Right? It's not even close. Of course, shadows are nice, but you want the real thing. And the reason I'm telling you that today is because this is how the Bible talks about things in the world compared with Jesus. The Bible says that things in our world are like shadows. They're kind of nice, but the real thing is Jesus. And remember, which is always better, the shadow or the real thing? The real thing. So as you look at your lives, I want you to, to think about that sometimes. Toys that we have, they're nice, but the real thing God gives us is Jesus. Having other people love us is nice, but real love, it comes from Jesus. Living here on this world is, is pretty nice, but Real life is waiting for us in heaven with Jesus. And so do you think we should spend our time thinking about the shadows here on earth or thinking about Jesus, our Savior? Thinking about Jesus, our Savior. All right, I want you to listen as, as I give the sermon today and think of, hear the times I talk about shadows and how the real thing that we trust in and believe in is Jesus. Let's say a prayer about that. Dear Jesus, it's pretty cool how you made the world and we can make shadows with sunlight. At the same time, Lord, we know that the real thing is always better than shadows. So we go through our lives. Help us not to spend our time thinking about just shadows here in this world. Help us to think about you and all the real blessings that come from you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up here. You can go back to your seats. In our sermons this month, we've been working through the book of Colossians. We're to our, our fourth sermon. There's, there's going to be six total. And so today our lesson comes from Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind, they have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. 
These rules, which have to do with things that are, are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. This is God's word. Dear friends in Jesus, I once visited with a, a woman who was a, a Mormon. Sadly, the, the Mormon church doesn't follow the teachings of the Bible. They add an extra book, the Book of Mormon, which, which changes a lot of what the Bible says about Jesus. And so as I listened to this woman tell her life story, in my mind, I, w- I was thinking to myself, how can I convince her that her religion is just man-made? How can I help her see how much better Jesus is? I was anxious. It's one of those moments where I wanted to make sure I said the right thing. Suddenly, though, she stopped her her life story and she said to me, I've got one question for you. At your church, can people drink coffee? My church says people aren't allowed to drink caffeine. I said, yes, at our church you can drink coffee. And she said, good, I'll go to your church then. I thought, I wish it were always this easy. Right? It's good. We don't have traditions like that, right? No drinking coffee. It's good. We don't make extra rules on top of God's word, right? Or do we? Let's be honest. Every one of us looks for ways to feel close to God. Every one of us looks for ways to feel like we're better than other people. So what is it for you? Maybe you don't look down on other people for drinking coffee. But what are the ways you you judge the people around you? Maybe it's you look around and you say, well, I'm at church today and -and so-and-so isn't here, so I must be closer to God than he is. Or you think, look at what she's wearing. I'm so much nicer dressed than she. I must be closer to God than she is. Maybe you think about the people that you know and you say, well, I don't drink as much as he does. I don't smoke like she does. And I stay awake during church. I'm like those people and I must be closer to God than they are. Those thoughts ever cross our minds? Even a traditional church like ours, we can have lots of traditions. So it's good for us to hear what the Apostle Paul wrote to those Colossians long ago. He started by saying, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or in regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Sounds like in Colossae, the city in the ancient world, it sounds like Christians were judging other Christians, just like we were talking about. And so Paul says to them, don't let anybody judge you based on what you eat or drink or on what day of the week you worship. Now, when you hear that, there there should be a question that comes to your mind. Do you know who it was who told the Israelites that they were not allowed to eat pork? God did. Do you know who it was who told the Israelites that they needed to hold specific religious festivals every single year? God did. Do you know who it was who commanded the Israelites to observe the Sabbath day, always to worship on Saturdays? God did. So this question should come to your mind. What's up with that? Maybe we can understand that following man-made rules, but aren't we supposed to follow God's rules that he gave in the Old Testament? Yes or no? And you all kind of shudder like, don't look at me. I don't have to answer that. Listen again to what Paul says. He says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or in regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. For these were all a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. A few weeks ago, I was playing with my boys in the backyard when I saw a shadow go across our lawn. 
Instinctively, I looked up. You know what I saw? A bald eagle. It was really cool. Do you know what I forgot about the moment that I saw the bald eagle? The shadow. I'm glad that I saw that shadow, but I'm way gladder that I saw the actual bald eagle flying in the sky. Shadows are helpful, right? Shadows point us to something else, but shadows are nothing compared with the real thing. So this is what Paul is teaching us. He says that even God's laws for the Israelites in the Old Testament, they were shadows. They were pointing to, ahead to a reality. What's the reality? It's Christ. It's Jesus. In the Old Testament, God gave the Israelites special food in the desert. Remember what the special food was that they had in the desert? It was manna. That was a good thing. They needed it. But that manna was just a, a shadow. Jesus later came and he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Manna is cool, but Jesus is so much better. In the Old Testament, God told his people they needed to sacrifice lots of lambs over and over again. You know, sacrifices were important. They taught the people that they were sinful, that they needed forgiveness. So why don't we do sacrifices in our church today? Because when Jesus came, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus. Do you remember what he said? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Those lambs in the Old Testament were all shadows. Jesus is the reality. And once you have the real thing, you don't need the shadows anymore. Does this make sense? The Bible is so connected. It's, it's one message from beginning to end, all focused on one thing, on Jesus. Take the Sabbath day. We talked about this in, in Bible class this morning. God commanded that the Israelites observe the Sabbath day. They couldn't work and they needed to worship God on Saturdays. It's even the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So do you and I need to keep that third commandment today? No, because Paul says even the, the Sabbath day, it's a shadow. The rest the Israelites found on Saturdays was pointing them ahead to true rest. And where do we find true rest? In Jesus. We could go on and on. Paul mentions religious festivals. Have you heard of the Day of Atonement? Yom Kippur? Each fall, it's the most solemn day of the year on the Jewish calendar. There's special sacrifices to make atonement for sin because we need our sins to be atoned for before God. And so why don't we celebrate the Day of Atonement anymore? Well, it's because there was a different day. There was a different day on which Jesus Christ died on the cross to take away the sins of the whole world. Which day was that? Good Friday. The Day of Atonement was a good day, but it was, it was a shadow. It's a shadow of what Jesus would do on the cross. Have you heard of Passover? Every spring, the Israelites celebrated how God rescued them from slavery in Egypt with the blood of the Passover lamb. And you and I, we need to be rescued too. We need salvation from God. Why don't we celebrate the Passover? Because in the Lord's Supper... Jesus gives us his own body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. All of these things from the Old Testament, they were good, they were from God, but, but they were shadows pointing ahead to Jesus and the reality is found in Christ. Can you see that? So here's the question that Paul asks us in God's word today. He asks, are you basing your life on shadows or on the real thing? As Paul writes, you can tell he was very concerned about the Christians in Colossae. He was concerned because even though they had heard about God's grace, they were tempted to, to go back into the shadows. He said, don't let anyone with their false humility and their worship of angels disqualify you. 
He said, these people have lost their connection with the head. In other words, in, in Colossae, there, there were people who were boasting about how humble they were according to their own rules. Kind of like somebody saying, wow, look at me, I'm so humble, I don't drink coffee. In Colossae, there were also people who felt like they were special because they, they created their own beliefs about angels, their own traditions, and Paul says they have lost their connection with the head. Who's the head? Christ, Jesus. They had lost their connection with Jesus. And this drove the Apostle Paul nuts. He says, since you have died with Christ, why are you still living as though you belong to this world? Why are you submitting to the rules of this world? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. He said, these rules are merely human commands and and teachings. And could you see what was going through Paul's mind? He was taking these people and he was kind of shaking them by the shoulders and saying, you know the real thing. You know Jesus. You know God's grace. You know that you're forgiven through Jesus' cross. You know that you're a child of God through baptism. And so why are you going back to your own rules? Why are you putting your confidence in your rules instead of in God's word? Do you know why? Do you know why we human beings since the beginning of time have always created our own rules instead of following God's word? There's a pretty simple reason. It's because our rules are way easier than God's rules. Just think about this. So Mormons teach that you can't have caffeine. God says, be perfect. Which is easier to follow? Catholics sometimes say that during the season of Lent, you can't eat meat. Jesus says, do not look at another person lustfully. Which one's easier to follow? Sometimes we boast about, why I go to church every single Sunday. And God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Which is easier? You see what I mean? We create man-made rules because they're so much easier for us to follow than the actual commands that God gives us in the Bible. But do man-made rules, do they, do they actually make us good? At the end of our lesson, Paul says this. He says, such regulations have an appearance of wisdom with their way of worship, with their humility, with their harsh treatment of the body. They have an appearance of wisdom but they lack any value in actually restraining sensual indulgence. Do our rules make us good? No way. Maybe they make us look good in other people's eyes, but not in God's eyes. What we need most isn't to avoid certain foods. It's to get a new heart. What you need isn't to, to cut caffeine out of your diet. It's It's the forgiveness of sins. What we need isn't to worship God on Saturdays. It's to worship God with our whole lives 24-7. So don't base your life on shadows. If any part of you thinks that by keeping your rules, that makes you good in God's eyes, you have lost connection with the head. If any part of you you thinks that that all you really need is to change a few things in your life and then you'll be good. You've lost connection with the head. If there's a part of you that thinks you can fix it on your own. Lost connection with the head. There's a voice inside of you that's telling you that, that you just need to try harder. You just need to work more and things will work out. You've lost connection with the head. If you think that what you eat or what you wear, or how you behave has any impact on God's love for you, and you've lost connection with the head. So just shadows. You see that? Paul says these are all shadows of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The gospel message of Jesus is so much better. The gospel tells us how we get 
a new heart. It's not by working harder. It's by being washed of our sins in baptism to become God's child. The Bible tells us why God loves us. It's not because we behave so well. It's by grace. It's by God's undeserved love for us in Jesus. The Bible tells us how we get the forgiveness of sins. And it's not by earning it or by working harder for it. It's because Jesus Christ died on the cross to take away the sins of the world. The Bible tells us where we can find true peace. It's not on any day of the week. It's in the forgiveness and the eternal life that Jesus brings. Don't base your life on the shadows. Look at the real thing. Look at Jesus. When you understand that, it's, it's freeing. In our country, we like to talk a lot about freedom. And God in the Bible talks a lot about freedom too. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, don't let anybody judge you by what you eat or drink. You are free from man-made rules and traditions. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have commands for our lives. God has lots of things to say about how Christians are to live. And we're going to talk about that next week. So come back. But for today... God wants you to know that his judgment of you isn't based on your goodness. God's judgment of you is based on Christ's goodness. And that frees you. It frees you from having to please other people. It frees you from worrying about what everybody else thinks. It frees you from trying to work your way to heaven. It frees you from trying to earn God's love. You don't have to do any of that because you have it already in Jesus by grace. This past week, I, I spent some time in, in Arkansas. It's part of my work on our district mission board. Another pastor and I were investigating opportunities for starting new churches. And in Little Rock, we met with a, a little group of nine Wells Lutherans who'd like to start a Wells church in, in Little Rock. And it was pretty striking, just nine people in the city of hundreds of thousands of people. And, I'll admit, there was this little part of me that wanted to ask these people, why don't you just go to another church? Right? Is it really worth all the effort to get a new Lutheran church here? And thankfully, I didn't ask that because in the middle of our meeting, one, one of the ladies started talking. And she mentioned how she has a daughter who is in college. And this daughter goes to a Christian college somewhere in Arkansas. And she says, do you know what our daughter tells us about her college? She says, Mom and Dad, there's no grace here. I go to chapel every day, but there's no grace. I go to Bible studies all the time, but there's no grace. I go to church with my new friends, but there's no grace. They're nice people. There's lots of rules, but there's no grace. And the lady said, this is what we found in the Lutheran church. We've heard about God's grace. And then before me or the other pastor could, could say anything, the, the husband, the, the dad, he started telling his story. He said that he grew up an atheist. He wanted nothing to do with God. And some Sunday, for some reason, he happened to go to a Lutheran church. And then he went back. For years, Sunday after Sunday, he said there wasn't any moment, there wasn't some special experience, but over time, something changed his heart from the inside out. Do you know what he said it was? God's grace. And he heard about God's free grace to us in Jesus. And so he said, you know, there's lots of places that have lots of rules. There's lots of places where you can find good motivational speakers there's lots of places that have great programs or fun kids' activities, but that's not what me and my family need. We need God's grace in Jesus. And my heart smiled. Those people get it, right? This is what it's all about. God's grace to us in Jesus. This is what sets Jesus apart from everyone and everything else. This is what makes Jesus different than all the shadows of this world. Have you ever heard what Buddha's last words were? So there was actually a, a man named Buddha who was the founder of the religion of Buddhism. He lived actually before the time of Jesus. 
Do you know what Buddha's last words were as he lay on his deathbed? He said, strive unceasingly. You hear that? I guess that makes sense, right? We say stuff like that. Keep working hard. Strive unceasingly. That was his, his last words. Compare that with some of Jesus' last words. As Jesus was on the cross, what did Jesus say? It is finished. It is finished. Can you see the difference? That's where peace is found. It's found at the, at the cross of Christ. That's where our strivings can cease. That's where our, our regret and our, and our guilt it gets put to death in the, in the cross of Jesus. Jesus says, for you and for me, it is finished. Your life isn't about don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. You can drink coffee. Don't live in the shadows. You have the reality. The reality is Christ. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we can relate to these Christians in the city of Colossae, even though they'd heard about you. They were tempted to turn back to their own rules and traditions and to raise them above you and your word. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask that you forgive us for every time we judge other people based on our standards and not on your standards. Forgive us for every time that we think that it's our goodness and our keeping our rules that's going to make you love us more. Dear Jesus, show us again and again your grace, your undeserved love for us that led you to die on the cross, to die for sinners like us. Help your grace to be what fills our hearts, that frees us from rules and traditions, and that leads us to show that love to other people too. May this church, may other churches continue to teach about your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Continue by confessing our faith in God with the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. When unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. <coughs> Life for the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. So at this point in our service, when we, we talk about our offerings to God, and today I just want to, to mention something that you know but our, our friend, our, our member, Ron Brancala, has passed away. And one of the things that Ron did behind the scenes, he did a lot of things behind the scenes, was that for the last many number of years, Ron has been the one who's faithfully collected our offerings and counted them and deposited them and faithfully kept track of your gifts to the Lord. And so one of the, the, the many reasons that we're going to miss Ron is for his faithful and his honest work in dealing with the finances here at our church. And so I, I'm, I'm thankful for the blessing that, that he's been to our congregation. I'm also thankful, though, that over this past week, um, our, the members of our stewardship team here at church have done everything they can to take all of those finances and offerings under control. 
And so I'm thankful for our treasurer, Dana Smith, and for Mario Isley, who's going to fill in as our financial secretary, and Dave Francis, and Sam Reed, and Joe Duan. I'm thankful for how our church leaders have come together, losing one of our members, and also making sure that we have good systems in place when you give your offerings. And so hopefully you know and believe this, but when you give offerings here to our church that they're, they're taken seriously, they're protected and deposited to make sure that what you give goes toward Jesus' work here at our church. And so thanks for your generous offerings for our ministry. We're going to go to our God now with our prayer of the church. We have a lot of people to pray for. And so we, we join our hearts together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what a, what a blessing to know that you are a God of grace. That means that there's no doubt that you love us on good days and bad days when we deserve it and when we don't. Your love for us is unconditional. It's trusting in your grace that we pray for a number of people connected to our church. We pray for the family of our member Ron Borncala as they mourn his death. We're thankful for the blessing that Ron was to our congregation for, for decades. He faithfully attended worship, he sang in our choir, and he served you behind the scenes in, in many ways. We're thankful for the blessing he was to us and we're thankful that he's with you in heaven. Please bless his, his family as they, they mourn in this difficult time. We pray for another member of ours, Ruth Curtis, who seems to be nearing the end of her life. As she rests in hospice care at this time, we, we pray that you be with her. Uh, bless the, the nurses who are helping her, be with her daughter, Lydia, who's taking care of her. Lord, may whatever days she has left on earth be good days. And when it's your time, may you take her home to be with you in heaven. Pray for our member, Steve Vaughn, who's been hospitalized with an infection. We're thankful that it seems like that infection is being beaten back. Pray that you continue to bless his recovery. We pray for the father of our member, Colin Walker. Colin's father's been dealing with some difficulties with his eyes and with his mind. Lord, we pray for this man, the gift of sight, the gift of memory. These are blessings from you. Please be with Colin's father as he struggles with these issues. Give him strength in you and patience in your time and trust in your will for his life. Finally, we pray for some friends of people here today, friends named Janet and Darla and Maria. All three of those ladies are facing difficulties in their lives. Lord, you know what those difficulties are. We pray that you be with them, that you provide them with your promises in Jesus, and that you bring them healing and salvation when it's your time. Pray all this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Talked in our sermon today about shadows. One beautiful thing that the Bible tells us is not a shadow is God's blessings to us in the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper, we get Jesus' own body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. It's such a special thing. The Bible also tells us that before we take the Lord's Supper, it's good to, to study what the Bible says about it. If you'll notice in your worship folder today on page three, there's a list of, of questions. These were put together by Martin Luther 500 years ago. This was his advice for people as they prepared to take the Lord's Supper, was to think through these questions about our sins, about God's grace, about Jesus' real presence and the Lord's Supper. And so for, for our members, as you're waiting to take the Lord's Supper today, maybe read through those questions and remember the answers we find in them from the Bible. For our guests today, we have the practice that Lord's Supper is open to those who are, are members of our church. And so if you're a guest today, I'd ask that you not come up for the Lord's Supper, but I'll be happy to meet with you and share God's word with you and maybe one day you can be a member here too. Continue with the liturgy for the Lord's Supper, which you find in your bulletin on page 14. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. 
Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy... Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll sing our, our last song. I am trusting you, Lord Jesus. It's been great to have you join us for our service today. Welcome to our, our guests who are here. I hope all of you come back and worship Jesus with us again soon. Just two special things coming up the next couple of weeks. First of all, Ron's funeral is this coming Saturday at 1 o'clock. And there'll be visitation before from 12 to 1. So you're all invited to join us for that. There won't be any meal after the service. Um, Ron's children have, have other plans. Um, but come and join us for the viewing and, and for the service on Saturday. And then a week from Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And so a week from Wednesday, we'll start up our, our Lenten dinners and devotions. That means each Wednesday night after this coming Wednesday, we'll have a meal at 6 o'clock, and then we'll have a Lenten devotion at 7 o'clock, starting on Ash Wednesday. And we had a great turnout when we did this during Advent before Christmas, so it'd be great to have many of you join us on Wednesday, starting on March 2nd. Take your time to talk to the people around you today and you can leave when you're ready. God's blessings on your week.